Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Anthony Salas, and on behalf of the American Marketing Association, I'd like to welcome you to today's webcast sponsored by Quantcast and titled A New Buying Model for Real-Time Media. We here at the AMA provide you with this webcast as one of the many special programs that we offer to the marketing community, and we invite you to participate in this ongoing series of free web seminars to help you drive, drive the greatest return on your marketing investments. Whether it's in research, advertising, promotions, social media, and beyond, our webcasts offer education in all key areas of marketing. So make sure to join us every week for these thought leader webcasts that do feature some of the most expert minds in marketing. You can find out more about our webcast by going to marketingpower.com forward slash webcast. And just a couple of notes about today's webcast. We will be um, recording today's webcast, and it will be made available to you very soon. If you have any technical or content-related questions, please use the chat feature located to the left of your viewing screen. Technical questions will be addressed at, uh, immediately upon receipt, and Content-related questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. However, feel free to enter those at any time as the presentation proceeds. And last, we do invite you to join the conversation on Twitter today during the presentation. We are using hashtag QuantCast, so please join us there. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker for today, Chris Martellotti, who is the Performance Marketing Strategist with QuantCast. With a background covering both search display and audience measurement, Chris works to develop strategies for helping performance marketers navigate the world of real-time media. As an early employee at Quantcast, he worked with publishers in leveraging the Quantcast measurement solution, which is now utilized by over 100 million publishers worldwide. And so with that, I'd like to turn things over to Chris to get us started. Thanks a lot, Anthony. Um, good morning, good afternoon to everybody, and uh, appreciate you joining us today. Um, hopefully we'll make this a pretty exciting hour and there's a lot of information we'll walk through and uh, look forward to kind of hearing your questions at the end and I guess we'll go ahead and start. The, uh, if you look at sort of media, for the past number of decades it's been bought on a CPM basis and cost per thousand impressions. And this has really been the currency by which marketers utilize to derive value from the ad placements that they're buying. CPMs in exchange of impressions, which is actually a, a proxy for the value that a marketer is trying to receive back. And the idea behind CPM is that really every impression is worth the same amount of money. And the web is actually far different for marketers because every impression is, is very different and can be valued very differently by each marketer. And it was only sort of with the advent of search marketing that the trend of CPM and that every impression was worth the same amount of money was broken. And in search, each marketer can place a distinct value on an audience, a keyword, and a line creative to kind of match the performance that they're looking for. And so search didn't actually change the concept of what performance marketing is and obviously getting a, a return on your investment, but it drastically changed how a marketer could look at, at the marketing landscape knowing that I can pay for a particular user that per search for a particular thing and put a price behind that. So that's a drastic shift in media buying. And one of the examples that I li I I'd like to give is, is if you think of sort of billboard advertising. Um, if you were to buy a billboard for a month, there's, you're going to look at research to say how many impressions are delivered for that billboard. And there may be a cost of you know, $20,000 that month for the billboard, knowing how many impressions you're getting. And so you can kind of back that into an effective CPM or effective cost and return on your investment. For a, for a marketer, it's always beneficial, marketers and agencies, always beneficial to lower the cost. So instead of paying $20,000, you may try to negotiate that price down to $15,000, knowing that every impression is worth the same amount of money, and if I can pay less, I will, I will see return from that. And so in a CPM world, there's a focus on kind of lowering the cost. And that's uh, the same thing happens online when you, if you think of kind of the RFP process and working back and forth with publishers. And really, uh, the display landscape has drastically changed recently uh, with the revolution of real-time bidding and real-time impression delivery and real-time buying opportunities. All impressions are not worth the same amount of money. And so it's really interesting for marketers to understand 
how to, how to generate value and ROI from real-time bidding in the, in the new um, display landscape that exists. Switch slides here real quick. If you look at sort of the last three years, RTB has grown dramatically. There is um, a large number of publishers that are placing inventory into exchanges, and I'll kind of walk through that in a little more detail. Publishers online that sell advertising space, a large majority of those publishers don't sell all of their inventory. So with that excess inventory, uh, what they need to do is find someone to purchase that inventory. And so on publisher by publisher, in the past they would run uh, house ads, they may run um, ads from ad networks and sell the inventory to them. But the key thing is that in many cases publishers wanted brand safety and the highest return on investment from their unsold inventory. And there was a big challenge in the marketplace because publishers weren't selling all their inventory directly and therefore they had all this unsold inventory that they needed to um, you know, place live. So with the advent of exchanges, which has really happened over the past four or five years, publishers actually have a lot of brand safety controls. They can control the types of advertisers that are running on their site in their unsold inventory. And that allows for real-time bidding on the marketer side. And so now there are uh, a large portion of publishers that have placed inventory in exchanges. So there's a, there's a big influx of inventory. And it's all available through RTB in a real-time bid. And there's a number of factors that sort of are important with real-time bidding, but one is sort of understanding the audience and the environment of which a user is in, and then placing a value upon that. And so to kind of relate this back to search, a lot of it is, you know, the difference with display and search is that you know when you buy a search ad, your, your, your advertising is going to appear on the search engine results page. With display, it could be across a large number of publishers. And so there's a lot of moving parts that happen in the display landscape. And the response time to, to come back to the exchange with your bid for a particular user in a particular context has to happen less than 100 milliseconds. So there's billions of impressions per day, but billions of opportunities for a marketer to, uh, you know, to find the right user and target them. And a big thing here is kind of the, the technical understanding of who a user is in placing that value that really determines success with an RTB and actually uh, delivering value in RTB. If we go to the next slide here, what, should, what we notice is that you know, in the past three years, trends have really emerged that provide a new path for a shift in display advertising. Um, if you look, it's in 2015, uh, display is actually supposed to eclipse search and spend online. And that's because marketers are seeing the value today, and I think um, we're going to talk a lot more about that and pricing models behind that. But um, RTB has really just shifted everything from how, how a marketer can look at the entire display landscape and actually get value out of that. Another thing that's really grown is the, the trends of sort of computing power and algorithms that can actually evaluate a user and understand what's happening with that user and the price to pay for them. And this didn't exist that, that much before if you think of five, ten years ago, but, but that's advancing a lot right now. And because the inventory is available on the publisher side, marketers can utilize uh, algorithms to really understand the value of a user and, and get the return out of that. If you look at sort of uh, the chart on the right, you can see the rise in you know, RTB growth over the number of years moving forward. And there's a lot of companies out there that are specializing either on the supply side and providing the inventory, and there's a number of companies on the demand side providing access to that inventory and solutions to really uh, get value out of RTB. So th that takes us to our first polling question, which I'd love to get sort of an idea from the audience of how many folks are participating in RTB and love to see sort of the adoption that people have with uh, real-time bidding. So 
So you can see that the, you know, has the adoption of real-time bidding, bidding significantly improved your campaign performance? Yes, no, unsure, or not currently buying through RTB? So we'll see that uh, the response is, is, is mixed, and that's what I thought may happen here. Um, a number of folks are saying yes, it's improved, 19%, 7% are saying no, 15% are saying it's unsure, and then 58% are not currently buying through real-time bidding. And so I can kind of walk through these answers and, and provide some context behind uh, why there's probably some mixed results here, which was sort of expected. Um, one is that uh, yes is great. That means people are probably using the right data sets, they've done analysis, and perhaps are somewhat more advanced in their uh, solutions with buying RTB. No <coughs> means <coughs> probably one of two things. One, either the, um, not buying correctly or the right types of users, and we'll talk a lot about that further in the presentation. Unsure is really interesting in 15%. One of the things we'll talk about later in the presentation is, is attribution and kind of understanding the value of what you're getting out of real-time bidding. And a lot of times people are getting far more or less value than they think they're getting based upon how their attribution systems are set up to evaluate either partners or, or, or budgets or anything like that. And then a large percent of people are not buying through RTB, so I'll, I will keep this presentation uh, as basic as possible to, to get everyone up to speed on kind of what RTB is and how it works. So one of the things that makes search unique and a, a real big movement of media buying is that planning, buying, and serving of ads all happen under the same construct. A user, a, a marketer can purchase a specific keyword and they know that when they, for example, if I purchase the keyword shoes, I'm going to show up when shoes is searched for and it's, it's going to serve. There's no, there's no disconnect between me wanting shoes and me serving an ad for shoes. In traditional display, there's a large disconnect with, that happens across the planning, buying, and serving. If you're familiar with the RFP process, what tends to happen is that you may create this sort of profile or audience of who you're looking for, and you may say, I'm looking for women 18 to 35 who are interested in um, fashion and also interested in shoes. You might send that RFP out to a number of different pu publishing partners, and you wait for their responses to understand who has the best match for the audience you're looking for. And then once you actually decide on the partners and you serve the ads, the audience that actually sees the impressions may be different than the audience that you thought of in the RFP or that you were looking for. And because of this disconnect and display that happens, marketers suffer from getting a strong ROI where search, because it's all tied together, the planning, the buying, and the serving, marketers can see a, a far stronger return. And so this real-time bidding is kind of allowed for the traditional display construct that you see here to change in that it can be something that's always on. It can be something that is the planning, buying, and serving are actually all tied together. And that can happen with using your own data and, and looking for users that look like your own customers. And so it's, it's become uh, a really unique way of buying, and it actually models right after how search buying uh, became successful. The next slide just kind of talks about search in a little more detail. Um, search is a value-driven buying process in that um, no search marketer talks about the success that they're having in a search campaign based on the number of uh, impressions that they're getting. Instead, search is thought of as how, you know, how effective is my ROI, how, how many leads am I getting. It's, it's a scale game and it's a value game. And if, as, as most probably marketers will know with search, is that it's an auction that takes place when a user puts a keyword in. And you realize that for particular keywords at particular times, for perhaps particular geographies, you will pay a certain amount knowing that how your creative is set up, the landing page, and the buying process, it's going to actually equal a positive return on your investment. And so search buying, the, the, the concept behind all of it is that marketers play around with adjusting the keywords, adjusting the creative, adjusting the bids to find the right sweet spot to actually drive the return that they're looking for. 
the, the challenge with search is that the dimensions tend to be limited. Typically, uh, you're buying specifically on a keyword and perhaps a geo. With display, this can be far larger. In fact, there's many different uh, dimensions to a display ad. You want to understand, one, who's the person I'm targeting? Are they, looking, are they the proper prospect for me? When is the right time to target them? Uh, you have to look at that because as I mentioned before, you're not targeting them on a search engine results page. You could be targeting them on millions of different sites. Creative obviously plays an important role because you want to understand uh, where the user is in the purchase cycle, what's, what's the type of advertising that they're going to respond to, and then how often. Um, some users may be early on in the purchase cycle. Some users may be further down the purchase cycle. And so depending on that, you may want to show more or less ads to them to drive the conversion to happen. And so display is bec through RTB can actually be very value-based just like search has become, where it's not necessarily looking at specifically impressions because impressions are all valued differently, but instead looking at saying, how many conversions am I actually driving? And, a, and it's, a, it's a far bigger challenge because of the dimensions that are at play in display are far larger than those that could be at display or that take place in search. So walking through the next slide, um, this is kind of looking at, at real-time bidding version 1.0. And as I talked about earlier, it's a, it becomes this sort of race to the bottom in that for a lot of marketers, they basically would say, I want a cheaper CPM, I want a cheaper CPM, obviously derive value. But you can see in this scenario that cheaper CPMs actually can equal far fewer conversions. And so it's, it's not necessarily taking advantage of what real-time bidding has to offer. And it focuses on the previous model of thinking that's all about cost as opposed to scale and efficiency. And so a lot of marketers have kind of dived into real-time bidding with, with the same mindset that, that they bought CPM with and kind of say, how cheap can I get a CPM because that's going to drive efficiency. And in reality, that isn't necessarily the case. I'll show kind of the, the advancement of real-time bidding in RTB 2.0, as we like to call it here, and, and where this really differentiates and actually matches very close to search. If you look at the slide on the right, you'll see that CPA being the, the X, or CPM being the x-axis, CPA being the y-axis, that the higher the CPM, the cheaper the CPA. And so this is actually very similar to search in that any search marketer will tell you that there are certain keywords they will pay a lot for because they're going to derive a lot of value from that. And there are certain keywords they will pay very little for because they're not going to see the, the return on that. And search is all about kind of understanding the, the bid to place behind a user or a keyword and you know, obviously having the creative and landing pages lined up with that. And so if you look at the right, this is the focus on value. So this, this mimics search so much in that it's a, it's a value-based way of looking at the world as opposed to just driving down CPMs and driving down CPMs. And it's great because finally display has this impression by impression buying. And so you can understand particular constructs with which to bid higher or lower on users or even have uh, machines do that for you that are kind of working on your behalf to operate and, uh, and drive the most value. The next slide is, is a polling question. So I wanted to ask uh, the audience what primary currency is for buying media today. Is it CPM, CPC, CPA, or, or another result? And typically, uh, we find a lot of search marketers obviously buying on a cost per click, uh, traditional display people on a CPM basis. And then um, CPA is sort of interesting in that it's um, the traditional CPA is a lot of sort of affiliates and things like that, but curious to kind of see the response that people are, are looking at. So flip to the results here in one second. So if we look at the, the results, it looks like we have probably a lot of display people on the call um, and a lot of search folks as well. Um, 
if I look at 44% are buying on a CPM basis, 31% are buying on a CPC basis, and 9% are buying on a CPA basis, and 15% are buying on another, other formats. Um, so a pretty good mix here, and, and as we kind of dive into value-based buying through display, uh, we can talk about sort of how CPA buying has a new, sort of a new light on it and a new way to look at it, and um, hopefully hear questions at the end related to that and how people that are traditionally buying CPM are now able to buy CPA because it's, it der derives a lot of value in, in real-time bidding exchanges. So as we move to the next slide, we talked about sort of the, some of the, cons the current buying models, people buying on a CPM, a dynamic CPM, which has become pretty common in real-time bidding, uh, cost per click, which is very search focused, or a cost per action. And CPA is actually becoming increasingly relevant in the world of real-time media because we've sort of talked about the fact that if every impression is worth a different amount, you don't necessarily need to plan have a media buy to say, I'm going to go buy 20 million impressions because that doesn't necessarily derive the value or the return you're looking for in a, in a, specifically in a performance world. And so with CPA, someone can actually pay for customers and not necessarily impressions. They can align their spending and optimization with business goals. And so this happens all the time with people with seasonality or, or launching new products or things like that. And they kind of can, can vary their CPA to scale up or down the amount of users that they're looking for. And most importantly, it sort of maximizes every opportunity to drive conversions. And, and part of this is really interesting because as I talked about before, where, where you're looking at users across the web that are sending off signals of potentially wanting to buy your product. In many cases, in spe specifically online, people sort of set rules behind their campaigns and said, you know, I'm willing to pay a $5 CPM for X amount of impressions, and I'll put a frequency cap of five per day on a user or five per week, and various rules like that. And with real-time bidding, it kind of puts a lot of those things um, to the side and really focuses 100% on performance and driving new users. So one of the challenges with CPA is that not everybody's ready for it. And that's uh, you know, one of the things that, that we've sort of learned firsthand here at QuantCast is sort of the, there's a tool set and kind of a best practices that need to be in place for buying CPA. And we'll, we'll walk through those in detail and kind of uh, hear feedback from you as well. The first is evaluating campaigns on an eCPA basis. So if you were, many marketers will buy campaigns from perhaps 10 different partners and some will be cost per lead, some will be CPM, some will be CPC. And so they have this mix of, of campaigns running on all different metrics. And it's only when you can kind of look at them all through the same lens and the same metric that you can understand who's valuable and who's not valuable. The second is understanding attribution, and we'll talk about this in a lot of detail as far as understanding the full marketing mix and who's, who's providing what value to you as a, uh, as a marketer and how do you actually pay, pay the people that are providing the value. Three is setting realistic CPA goals, which can be very challenging, I think, um, specifically if marketers are focused on search or focused on prior display efforts. How do you look at all of your marketing channels and say, what's the CPA goal I should, I should start with, or how do, I, how do I dive into this? And four is sort of choosing the right partners to work with. And obviously there's to understand or to, or to choose a partner that can actually evaluate the real-time bidding landscape and provide value to you is, is not an easy thing to do. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of companies in the space um, you know, building algorithms and providing uh, tool sets to, to pr provide value to a marketer. So we'll walk through these in a little more detail. Um, the first is evaluate the eCPA today. Um, what we, you know, I've heard from a lot of marketers is that search is getting more and more exp expensive, specifically unbranded search and actually driving value out of that is really hard. And typically search is bought on a CPC basis. And so it's hard for marketers that, are, that come from a search background to kind of think of the display landscape in a different world. And it's only if you could say, if I look at all of my marketing mix and align it to an eCPA goal, what's my return that I'm getting? And so this um, allows you to do that. And we sort of look at this campaign internally when we're, we're working with various partners to understand 
uh, the value we feel we're providing in helping them set the proper CPA goals. The next is understanding attribution. So I'll take a little while to kind of walk through this slide. Um, if we walk from left to right, it, you can kind of think of left being a user out on the web and then the far right being where this user converts for a uh, Hawaii Grand Hotel. There are always users sending off behavior that's showing interest in your product. The simplest example, if someone's uh, searching for a car and they're on various car sites, they're reading car reviews, there's a good chance that you probably want to target them if you're selling an automobile. And so on the far left, there's kind of this prospecting of, of display ads where people are served a number of ads, in this case the hotel. You're served an ad on a travel site, serve the ad on a weather site. And display then can drive search behavior. So here you have someone searching for Hawaii hotel reviews. They end up on a review site, and then they end up on hawaiigrandhotel.com. Once they leave that site, they get retargeted. So Hawaii Grand Hotel is working with a retargeting partner who serves another display ad. The user then goes and does a, a search for Hawaii Grand Hotel, so a branded search term, and ends up back on the site and ends up converting. So if you look at this sort of media mix here, there's a lot of people at play and there's a lot of things happening and the user is exposed a number of different times to your, uh, to your banner impressions or, and, and search ads as well. And it's hard for someone to say, okay, well, who gets the credit for that conversion? This is something that I think the industry generally is, is challenged with and there's a lot of people working very hard to come up with solutions for attribution because typically people kind of focus on the far right-hand side of a last click or a last view where the harder thing or perhaps where the most value is actually derived is on the far left where you're prospecting and finding a user who's, who's in market, hasn't been to the site before, but you actually serve them ads to drive them to the site. And so that's um, kind of evaluating search and display and how they interact with each other, how they derive an eventual conversion is, is a big industry challenge. And so uh, that's something that I think marketers in general need to really understand, specifically for CPA as well. Um, any CPA campaign that's focused on a conversion is likely going to, to take advantage of retargeting, prospecting, and the whole mix because once you're paid on a conversion, you have to do all of those things to actually drive a user to the end goal. Um, so this is, this is a big industry challenge. It's more of a marketer to understand the, the different things that map out within a user's uh, end, ending up converting. And I think one of the, the more fascinating things to look at too from, a, from an online perspective is that if you think of a, a retail site that may get 30,000 converters a month on their website, it's likely that there were 30,000 different pathways that those users came from. And it's really challenging for a marketer then to understand it, to, to assign value or to make that easier to say who's providing what value from a marketing mix to drive those 30,000 converters. And so it's, it's incredibly challenging on the web and um, most important just to kind of understand that. The next slide talks about attribution a little in, in a little more detail as well. Most ad servers or traditional technologies that are used today are actually very are not very advanced when it, regarding attribution. They're set up for a first or last event. And so if, I look at, if we looked at that slide before of the Hawaii Grand Hotel, they'd give all the credit to branded search. Or in a display perspective, give all the credit to a retargeting ad. And so that really takes attribution down to a, a simplistic form, but it's not necessarily capturing what's actually happening and what's, what's driving the value. A lot of sort of the newer attribution systems that, are, that companies are creating or utilizing are becoming either rules-based and then more specifically algorithmic to provide the most advanced level of understanding of who's providing what value, what, what part of the funnel, and what, you know, what ad you're showing to a user. And every business is going to have a different form of attribution. I think a big thing with this is understanding the, uh, the purchase cycle a user may have, the um, you know, the, the complexity of a conversion for them. Is it, is it signing up for an email or a, a newsletter or is it actually buying something? And all of those things play into how the, uh, the attribution is going to be credited. And so this is understanding that 
even the industry itself, the ad servers and those types of things are not necessarily set up properly today to, to give the full scope of what's happening in the marketing mix. The next is setting a realistic CPA goal. And so this is really challenging for a lot of marketers as they, as they explore this value-based pricing model in RTB because CPA goals can vary uh, all the time. And a lot of people are familiar with CPA from a, from a kind of an affiliate network perspective and things like that. But in reality, with CPA and real-time bidding, what it's doing is saying, I'm going to place a price a CPA payout on finding users that are in market for my product that end up on the confirmation page. And so it's not, it's not click driven. It's typically understanding I'm going to, I want to scale my business and I'm going to place a value on these new users that come through. And as I talked about in the last couple slides, most of these people may interact with a number of different partners that you have, media partners or things like that. So providing that one CPA goal is, is actually much more complex because it ends up being a few different CPA goals or a partial payout to a number of different partners. And so our sort of suggestion for finding a CPA goal is look at sort of current benchmarks for success. So if you're running search, both unbranded and branded, what does that look like? How, is it, um, how are the CPAs vary and how do, how do they vary by time of year or anything like that? Um, that's probably the easiest one to look at if you're looking for a CPA is to kind of understand your, your search performance. There's also people that, are, that can use things like email campaigns and, and what are you trying to drive for email campaigns and what are the response rates for that. Or um, if you have online video or branding efforts or anything like that, there, you have to look at your full marketing mix to understand wh what, what's happening today and how do I utilize this to, to move forward and actually get the proper CPA. And the other thing is it's not necessarily a static number. With CPAs, those can increase or decrease depending on what you're looking for in the time of year. I think CPAs is designed to be an always-on type tactic with, with display advertising and, and utilizing RTB. And it's less of saying it worked or didn't work. It's saying, how do I actually find the right price that works all around? And so that's a really interesting thing to think about. Um, when you, when you take it back to kind of that RFP process and running a campaign for a quarter, RTB allows for that not to happen and, and to be a lot more like search and kind of run campaigns consistently. The next slide is choosing the right partner. Um, as we talked about earlier, there's so many variables at play with display advertising. Uh, understanding who, where, when, what ad to show, what price, how often. Those, aren't things, those are things that are much more complex than, than simply a, a buying a keyword through search or something like that. And, so, and especially because you have to respond in 100 milliseconds of time to a particular bid request with a proper bid, the, the sort of right partner is someone that can, that can take advantage of that. And there's things I'll we'll talk about in here, sort of an integrated process. Um, a lot of that's the planning, the buying, and the fulfillment is happening with the exact audience that you're looking for as opposed to the, the old way of the RFP process and getting kind of mixed results back from different partners. Obviously, the ability to handle the real-time request and kind of the technology to do that. Big data. Um, I think this has become sort of a big buzzword in the industry, but a lot of it, it's understanding are there nuances or specific things about your customer that you wouldn't think of top of mind but actually can help derive performance from a campaign? And can you utilize that data to make better creative, uh, drive more efficient bid requests, better landing pages, all those types of things? That's, that's actually a really important thing. And there's a lot of stuff talking about can you tie big data to a big brain that can actually process the data, understand in real time to say, this user is worth a lot of money, this impression is worth a lot of money, and therefore I will pay effectively a high CPM to get in front of this user knowing that they will end up converting. And that's kind of the machine learning and the big brain behind it that can, can actually handle all of those bid requests and make the best approach for a marketer. C CPA is a, the easiest way to kind of make this an easier buying method because it takes the challenges out of it. And instead of looking at each bid request and actually responding with something or setting parameters for a bid request, 
you can have machines do a lot of that work for you to drive uh, the highest ROI you're looking for. And so um, the RTB sort of 2.0 toolkit consists of those things, and that's how you're going to see success um, out of real-time bidding. So the next slide is talking about um, how does this complement current search strategies. And so this is a slide that we like to use to kind of talk to a lot of performance marketers about always-on campaigns. Um, obviously, search budgets can change throughout the year, specifically during high times and low times. But there's, most performance marketers are always running some sort of a search effort. And there's that kind of core paid search, which is running 365 days a year and always on. CPA targeting can kind of be the next circle of something that's always on. Granted, it could fluctuate just like search could fluctuate. But it's finding that right CPA price to, find, to put ads in front of new users. And as you kind of have additional budget, some of the more um, things like social, video, mobile, or CPM buying can take place there. But those are things that may get cut back because they're not necessarily 100% performance focused, where CPA buying is value-based buying that's 100% performance, and so therefore it can kind of exist outside of paid search and run all the time, uh, just like this, this graph shows here. And the next is kind of talking about seasonality. And so um, if you look, this is kind of a, a yearly time frame of a search marketer, and obviously there's uptick in May, kind of down for the summer, and then a Q4, you know, a lot of spend is happening. And so CPA buying can exist to, to complement the search efforts and have even pacing. You can increase the CPA to have more volume, decrease the CPA to have less volume. And there's a lot of ways that this really complements search because I think if you, t if you were to talk to any search marketer, they'll talk about the efficiency and the, the, the ROI that's derived from branded search terms. And in many cases, how do you drive more branded search terms? Well, there's obviously a lot of things that can do that, just more awareness of your brand and things like that. But having a, a CPA effort and showing your brand in front of users that are in market for your product can actually um, you know, drive a lot more searches and branded searches at that. So, so you, there's a real big correlation between search and display, and I think that's becoming clearer and clearer to a lot of marketers in that uh, Search, search and display don't necessarily live in different, different camps. They operate together in a lot of ways. And uh, this slide sort of shows that in more detail. So the summary of kind of moving to a value-based approach is the first, RTB is really a historic opportunity for performance marketers to shift to value buying approach for display media. Um, I think no one will argue that the, the, the way that search has been bought, and specifically AdWords and Google and that kind of process really changed the game for performance marketers because it, it was tied together uh, impression by impression buying as opposed to CPM kind of flat level buying. And um, now that opportunity is available on display, which it never was before. And so, that, so the growth is happening and, and the opportunity is there. A CPA model is the clearest way to align marketing goals with spending if the right foundation is in place. As we talked about, not everybody's necessarily a candidate for CPA because there's a lot of things that y you've got to have to understand the value that's happening throughout the funnel. But it does align with the marketing objectives of, of growing a business. And if you can guarantee that you're only paying for advertising that's, that's shown to prospects that are coming and converting on your site, that's a pretty uh, compelling argument for CPA buying and display. CPA buying can work well in tandem with search spending and deliver against ongoing as well as seasonal goals. And to give you an example of that, we, have, we definitely have um, clients that are retail clients. And some of them, when they launch new products or new product lines, they can increase their CPA to drive increased demand. Obviously, during downtimes, perhaps in the summer, you can cut back the CPA because there's just less users interested in your product. And so it's, it's more of a, it's kind of like a volume knob that you move up or down as opposed to an on-off switch. And when marketers can think of it that way, um, they really find the value out of CPA buying. And just finally, just uh, about Quantcast, we have two solutions that we 
have here, we have an audience measurement solution and an ad targeting solution. And I uh, wanted to provide you just a little insight into the company, if, if for those of you that are not aware. We pioneered the direct measurement for publishers, and so there's 100 million sites that are utilizing our measurement tag. And these are, the, these are websites across the web, blogs, very large sites. And uh, you can go to the quantcast.com website and actually see profiles for millions of different publishers. And it's a free service for anybody to utilize. And there's an ad targeting solution. So um, what we do here is we utilize uh, our analysis of what, what people are doing across the web to create unique profiles for marketers to find their best prospects across the web. And because we have all those sites quantified, it really works out well for a marketer to um, utilize sort of our custom models to find people that are showing off signals of intent of their product and placing ads in front of them. And so just wanted to give you a, a background on, on Quantcast. And from there I will turn it over to Anthony. Perfect. Thanks so much, Chris. Appreciate that. Um, we've got a lot of great questions coming in, so we're going to go ahead and move into our Q&A portion of the presentation here. Um, just a reminder to everyone, if you have a question you have not um, asked it yet, use that chat feature located to the left of your screen there, get it in, and we're going to do our best to get to as many of these questions as we can in the time that remains. Um, one question that has come up uh, from some individuals, and I'll just address that before we do the content part of it, is um, are the slides going to be available and is the recording going to be available? And uh, the response is that we will definitely be sending out a, um, a link to the recording um, of today's presentation, so be on the lookout for that. However, we will not be including the slides. So um, again, just to uh, confirm that the recording will be shared, but the slides will not. So look for that very soon. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and um, jump into some questions here. And uh, first question we had, Chris, that came in, um, I believe uh, this kind of goes back to earlier in the presentation. Um, can you just clarify, um, you were using the term publisher, and can you clarify like, what exactly the meaning of that term is regarding this? Sure, sure. So a, a publisher on the web would be anybody that's obviously producing content or has a website. And so if, you, know, you could think of large traditional publishers like an NBC or Time. They have large websites. They have sales teams kind of selling sponsorships and and ad placements to, uh, to marketers. And so those would all be defined as publishers across the web. And obviously they can be, the wonderful thing about the Internet is you can start a blog or start a small website and actually be a publisher yourself. And it doesn't take, and that's why there's hundreds of millions of sites across the, the web. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Perfect. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, let's see, next question we have is, um, how do you buy on CPM in RTB without knowing the cost in advance? Great, great question. So t the way an RTB auction will work is typically there's a floor price that's set. Um, and in some cases, as I mentioned, a lot of publishers f feel more comfortable placing unsold inventory into exchanges because they have tools to provide brand safety on who's advertising on their site. Um, some of these tool sets allow them to create their own floors, and so they may say, I, you know, I don't want anyone buying on my site under a $2 CPM, and so that becomes the, the floor price in an RTB auction. And then in, in many cases, there's just kind of a standard floor, and so you, you, you place a bid on a user. The floor can vary, but that's kind of how that works. Just to, it's very similar to search in that um, I believe the minimum price for a click on a search is $0.10, cents, and so a floor is set there, and, and you can't buy a, a, a click and search cheaper than that. So it's very similar to how RTB works, that there's a floor set, and you kind of place a, an auction or a, a bid price depending on what the user's value is to you. Um, one other thing, and I don't want to get too tied into details on this, some of the exchanges offer sort of first price auctions, second price auctions, and things like that. But basically what, what happens is you want to place a bid that matches the value of a user, and that's another reason why we feel you know, CPA is sort of a, a new metric to look at because you know exactly, or using the right data and using the right partners, you would know exactly the bid price to place to derive the value you're looking for uh, to be in front of a particular user. Excellent. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Um, 
let's see, the next question we have, uh, again, kind of a clarification here. Uh, earlier you were giving the example about the hotel, um, and during that you were uh, used the term conversion. Can you define um, what you meant by conversion in that example? Sure. So just as an example with a hotel, you could say the conversion there is, is actually booking a room. And so, you know, obviously performance marketers that are buying in search, you know, if someone types in the word Hawaii hotel and you have a hotel in Hawaii, you may want to be there to actually get that user to, to book a room at your hotel. And so that's what's sort of thought of as a conversion there is someone actually completing the process and signing up for a hotel room. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, really the key takeaway from that particular slide was that if you step backwards, you'll see that there's a lot of different things happening to that user before they converted. And any site that gets any large number of conversions per month, every user tends to come from a different pathway to end up converting. And so it's really hard to say, you know, if you know that, if you're the marketer yourself and you're running a hotel and say, I know I need to book a hotel room at $50, and that's sort of your CPA goal for a hotel booking. How do you know how to spend that $50 across your various partners who might be doing, obviously, search efforts, prospecting efforts, retargeting efforts, and, and maybe any other th marketing efforts you have there? How do you, how do you know who's driving that $50 conversion? Excellent. Hopefully that helps. Yep, absolutely. I believe that's uh, right on target there, so thanks for that. Um, next question, we have kind of a two-parter here. Um, what ad platforms offer CPA, and how do I know where to get started? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a good question. So, you know, one of the things, um, and I'll talk a little bit about Quantcast here. I mean, one of the things that we've done is, is we've looked at kind of the growth of RTB and thought that CPA is, is where a lot of this will go for performance marketers because it's less about buying the impression specifically and more about actually just buying conversions. And there's a lot of, an, it's not an easy thing to do. There's a lot of analysis to understand how many impressions delivered to certain users of a certain criteria are going to end up turning into the conversion. So we have seats on the exchanges. We buy in a real-time bidding capacity. Our bids are always in a CPM basis because that's how the exchanges offer the bid. But we translate that into a CPA for a given marketer, and that's actually not a very easy task. Um, I'm not sure if other platforms do. I do think there's a, there's a few other folks out there that do offer CPA pricing with display, but it's, it's, it's very challenging. And that's, we think it's sort of a new form of media buying that's going to change things for performance marketers, and that's why we, we sort of talked about it uh, with this webinar. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, let's see, next question we have here. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what might be some good benchmarks to use when setting a CPA? Yes, it's a, a good question. The, the, one of the things that um, I think one of the challenges with display that, that we see today is a lot of marketers have, have kind of d dived into display and they've done retargeting, which, is a, which works really well, and, and marketers, performance marketers should do that. And if you compare retargeting to, kind of search, or to search efforts, it's very similar to branded search. Um, with retargeting and display, someone has been to your website, perhaps they've even put something in your shopping cart or interacted deeply with your site, and then they left the site and didn't actually do what you wanted them to do, be it purchase or, or check out or anything like that. And so you can place an ad in front of them to get them to come back to remind them that they were interested in something on your site. In most cases, that user is familiar with your website. They've, they've shopped around or they've gone through the site, and so when you show your brand in front of them again, there they know it. And so retargeting is actually very similar to branded search in, what, in, in both its return on investment and, and in, you know, the fact you should kind of always be doing that. In CP, CPA buying, I think one of the, the values is actually the prospecting. And so finding value in unbranded search is getting harder and harder and more, ex more expensive quarter over quarter. It's very hard to do that, especially Q4. I think any marketer that's spending in search right now is you know, trying to find any, any little uh, adjustment they can make to their campaign to find more value. And we sort of look at CPA at, at Quantcast as, as a prospecting thing. If we can prospect and actually find users that are showing off intentions of converting or intentions of buying your product or signing up for your service, 
we can, we can go find those users and actually drive them down the funnel. And so um, a lot of the analysis we do is kind of comparing our prospecting efforts to things like unbranded search, because unbranded search is, is that, from a search perspective, it's, it's a prospecting effort. If someone types in the word car insurance, they're not saying State Farm or Allstate or Geico, they're just looking for car insurance, and so they're in market. And actually the same thing can happen with display of someone surfing across the web and showing off signs that they're interested in car insurance. And if you're a car insurance marketer, you probably want to be in front of that, that user so that you can drive them to your brand as opposed to a competitor's brand. Um, and so we look at sort of when you set up benchmarks or trying to understand your CPA is, is breaking apart your search and looking at it from a, the micro audiences you may have in search efforts, comparing branded and unbranded, and kind of using that to start with, and then understanding you know, the purchase cycle of your users, um, how many users are kind of buying the first time you visit the site. There's a lot of nuances to it, but, but kind of starting with search is probably the best way to uh, you know, find the right CPA. Perfect. Okay. Thanks so much for that one. Um, and again, still getting a lot of good questions here. So. Uh, continue to send those in. Uh, we're doing our best to get through as many as we can, so please keep them coming here. Um, next question we have, um, this participant is saying that um, he's, he's used to CPA from an affiliate network perspective, um, and so they're judging everything based on last click. So how different is um, the form of CPA um, that you're discussing from that type? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I, you know, some marketers have maybe a negative construct of CPA, because not and some have positive constructs. But the um, CPA of old, or I can think of CPA five years ago, was sort of spraying and praying across the web. Like, I will serve an ad to every single person, and someone's going to end up converting. <laughs> and, and CPA with an RTB is is not that. And it, it can be, I'm going to find this targeted group of users who I'm going to go prospect and put ads in front of and, and you know, see who responds and analyze that. Display ads, there's, uh, especially with audience buying, so just to give you a flavor for audience buying, it's with, if you are a, or I'll use the Hawaii Grand Hotel example. If you're a hotel marketer, you may want to show ads on a lot of different types of sites, so weather sites, travel review sites, you may even be, want to be on sports sites or um, you know, if someone's checking their email, which doesn't have a lot of context to it, but obviously a very highly used thing across the web. Audience buying will show ads to somebody during those, those types of placements. The click-through rate on that is going to be incredibly small. It's going to be smaller than any context you might be able to buy. But what you're finding is if, if, you, if you actually have the right data on a user and you under, can understand that user, they're in market for your product, so it's actually very important for you to be placing your ads in front of them to drive them to your site, knowing that they may be, may be making a purchase within the next seven days. Or, th or they're, you know, if you think of an email, they could be emailing their uh, significant other about whether the, this purchase is actually uh, something they should be doing or not. And so audience buying allows you to kind of capture users at that stage of the funnel. And if you're judging by clicks, you won't find success. It's, a, it's almost a way to, to, to know that CPA buying isn't working if you're judging it strictly by clicks. And granted, based upon your CPA goal, does audience buying get 100% of the credit for driving a conversion? Not necessarily, but it, should, it can get a portion of it. And with CPA, what's so great is you're only paying for the users that are served ads that actually do end up converting as opposed to any ads that you served for people that didn't end up converting. Perfect. Okay, thank you for that one. Um, let's see, next question. I'm trying to get the, the better here. Um, let's go with this one. So this person says that um, since we're seeing RTB and CPA pricing models continuing to grow, uh, what do you think the impact on that will be with, uh, for publishers? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, uh, I think you know, some of the initial challenges, specifically with kind of, as I described, the RTB 1.0 version of buying, is that there was quickly a race to the bottom, and, and marketers were saying, oh, well, now I can buy impressions really cheaply. But I think that sort of doesn't take RTB for what it is, and that 
um, if, you, if you relate that to search, it's saying, I will buy any keyword for 50 cents. I don't care what it is, I'll buy it for 50 cents. Which wouldn't work for a search marketer, and I think anybody in search would completely understand that. And that's kind of how people went into RTB initially, was saying, I'm going to buy the cheapest impressions possible because they're available to buy. And the advancement that's happening will really find value within publishers. Um, I know, you know, looking at various data points, if you see a CPA or RTB bid requests that are $30 or $40 effective CPMs, publishers will benefit dramatically from that. And that's kind of the way that RTB is moving, is less of a race to the bottom and more of a thing where a marketer says, I want to scale my campaign, I want to find value, and I'm willing to pay for that. And just as you know, there's obviously keywords that make a lot of money in search because they're just so highly priced, the value's there. RTB allows that for publishers, and the minute publishers start seeing that on the back end, kind of through their exchanges and, and for their remnant inventory, they can actually see a large, uh, a large increase in their effective CPM that they're getting for their unsold. Perfect. Thanks so much uh, for that one. Looks like we probably have time for one more question. Uh, so I'm going to close with this one, and that question is, will CPA work for brand campaigns? Yes, um, yes, they will. <laughs> and I'll just, in a little more detail, I feel every, every marketer for every campaign is looking for some sort of a goal. And whether that's a, a site visitation, um, you know, interacting with a specific white paper you may have, um, looking at a specific product page, there's always a, an end goal that you're looking for. for and, and so a brand campaign in many, in many cases are, are you know, I can, I can think of an example of if someone's launching a new product line. You may have a brand campaign to make the world aware of this new product line that you have. But you can actually measure that by specific characteristics. If there's a, if there's a product page that you have or there's a micro site that you've created, you could value that by saying, I'm going to actually put a price on a visitor to this site or someone who watches this entire video that we've created. You can, cre you can create a CPA for any action that you have. And so what's great about brand campaigns is obviously there's a broader awareness. And you know, watching a video or, or looking at a product page is a far, easy, or far simpler conversion than uh, going through a fun you know, funnel and actually putting your credit card down. So it absolutely can work for brand campaigns. It's just kind of putting a metric on some of the, the upper funnel things that you have on your site that you want people to inter interact with and, um, you know, and launching that way. So it certainly can work for brand campaigns. Perfect. Thanks so much, Chris. And as I said, uh, probably was our last question because uh, it looks like we are right up against our scheduled end time. So we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Um, Chris, on behalf of the audience, thank you so much for um, all the great information that you shared. Uh, getting a lot of uh, great comments and feedback, so truly appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for, for listening. And again, just a reminder to everyone um, that uh, we will be sending out a follow-up, and that will contain a link to the recording of today's webcast, so please be on the lookout for that. Um, also encourage you to keep that conversation going on Twitter. If you did not join us there, uh, feel free to do that at any time. And again, that hashtag for today is hashtag Quantcast, so please join there. So in closing, I'd like to thank Quantcast, who was our generous sponsor for today's webcast, as well as ReadyTalk, who provided the web platform for um, today's webcast. And if you'd like to learn more about ReadyTalk and their services, you can go to readytalk.com forward slash AMA. Last but not least, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your time and attention and invite you to keep joining us for our weekly Thought Leader webcast. That does end our presentation for today. Thank you so much for joining. Have a great rest of your day.